Hi, welcome to my course on Azure Basics. So in this particular course, we'll discuss about service apps, which is basically the platform as a service tool that is provided by Azure. So this course will cover two main topics. The first one is static web apps, in which we will create a static web application using just JavaScript, and we will deploy it using service apps. And the next topic that we'll discuss is app service, in which we'll create a node server, and that node server will be deployed to cloud using service apps. We'll also discuss about various other configurations and tools that are provided by App Service. So I hope you have a good time and please do not hesitate to get in touch with me and I will see you in the course. So in this particular section, we'll talk about creating a static web app. So in our previous chapters, we had seen how using your storage account, you could create a static website. However, that particular way of creating your static website had a few issues. The first issue was that it's not connected directly to a GitHub account. So if you have to make changes and redeploy it, then it has to be done manually. Static web apps are directly connected with GitHub or Azure DevOps to monitor a branch of your choice. So every time you push a commit or you accept a pull request into the watched branch, a build is automatically run and your apps and APIs are directly deployed to Azure. And the second reason why static website trumps over your storage account static website is that your static website is distributed across the globe. Whereas when you create a storage account static website, that particular website is located within a particular region. And if you are living on the other side of the globe and if you want to access it, then there is a bit of latency. Whereas if you're using a static website, then these files are distributed across the globe. And if you are a person connected anywhere on the globe, then you will be connected to the nearest server to fetch that particular file. So that is it for this particular section. In our next section, we'll create a static website. So I'll see you there. Okay, so now let's create a static web app. So you can just search for static web app on your search bar here, or you can go to your all services and underneath web, you can find your static web app. So you can just click on this and let's create a static web app. So you can click on create and you need to give a resource group. So let's, create a new resource group. Let's just call this as static web app. Click on okay. You need to give a name for your static web app. So let's just call this as my first static web app. And let's go down. And here you have two options. You can either go for the free or for the standard purpose hosting plan. So let's compare both of them. As well as custom domains, there can be five custom domains set per app. And then there is also custom authentication and private endpoints that is connected with your standard plan. And also the max app size can be 500 MB if you're creating a standard, whereas for free, it's just 250. And there are three stage environments that are provided, whereas if you're using the standard one, there are 10. And also if you're using Azure function, there is just the managed one, whereas for standard that is there is managed or bring your own so the important thing here is basically the maximum app size so make sure that if you're creating a free static web app that it's below 250 mb whereas if you're creating one above 250 then it has to be within standard so for our purpose let's just create a free plan let's click on select and here is where you need to give your source so and here you choose your source. So here the source we will choose would be the GitHub account. So let's click on sign in with GitHub. I'll click on authorize. Click on confirm password. Okay, so I have signed into my GitHub account. So the next thing that I'll do is I will log into GitHub and I will create a new repository. So let's do that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a repo. So Let's go to repositories, click on new. I'll just call this as my static web app. I'll make this private. So let's just add a readme file and it will be set to main. So, and let's also just give a MIT license and let's cl click on create repo. Okay, so now that I've created my repo, I'll just copy this. And before doing that, I will just create a file. I will just click on add file, create a new file. I'll just call this as my index.html. 
And within this file, let's just add a few HTML tags. And let's just call this as hello world. Yeah, that's the only thing that I'll do. I'll click on save. Click on commit new file. Okay, so I've committed create in my repository. So let's click on copy the static web app. Let's go back to our Azure console and let's just select that repository. So static web app is, is the repo that we've just created and the branch is main. So let's click on that. And here we need to give the build preset. So if you're creating your front end using any of these frameworks, then you can choose one of these. But since we are just creating an HTML page, all that you need to do is you just need to click on custom. And the app location here would be just the main root itself. So because we've created the index.html within the root, it, within the root itself. So you do not need to give any particular path as such. And the API location and output location is something that we don't need to give. The API location is if you have created backend Azure functions for this particular application, which we will not do for this particular example. Let's click on review and create. And let's click on create. So finally, our application has been deployed. So all that you need to do is you need to just click on this URL to see your website. And you can see that this particular website has been properly deployed. So that's it for this particular chapter. In our next chapter, we'll talk about how this particular workflow got deployed using the GitHub action runs and the workflow. So I'll see you in the next chapter. So in our previous chapter, we had created a static web app and this is the URL for that particular web app. So if you open this, it redirects you to the web app and it just displays a hello world because we had just put in one line of HTML code. Now, the other thing to note is that there is also another file that gets created. So let's go back to our GitHub account. So if you go to a repository, you can see that there is a GitHub folder that gets created and within that there is a workflow. So let's open this particular workflow. So this workflow was created when you created your static web app with this particular repository. And if you look at this particular GitHub workflow, you see that this particular deployment happens on two occasions. That is when you push a change to the branch, the main branch, and the other one happens whenever you send a pull request to the main branch. So on these two occasions, the build and deploy job happens. So let's do an example for each one of this case. So let's do an example when we push a change to the main branch directory. So let's go back to our static web app. And here in, I'm in my main branch. So let's click on the HTML page. Let's edit this particular HTML page directly. And what I'll do is I'll make some changes to this. So I'll just copy this. And let's type in another test. So when I click on this commit change, the deployment should automatically be triggered. So let's click on commit changes here. Now to see whether the deployment is happening, you can go to your actions tab and let's refresh this. And you can see that there is a new change or there is a new workflow run that is happening. So this trigger change happened when I pushed that particular change directly to the main branch. So let's wait for this particular deployment to be over. So let's keep refreshing this. Okay, so the workflow has successfully run. So let's go back to our website and let's refresh this once. And you can see here that the change has been reflected in this particular URL. So that's how we can make a change when you update some code directly to the main branch. So in our previous chapter, we had seen that how when we pushed a change to the main branch, the build and deploy job got triggered and this updated all the changes in the front end. So in this particular chapter, we'll do something different. We will send a pull request to the main branch. So what we'll do is we'll create another branch from the main branch. We'll make some changes and then we'll send a pull request to the main branch. And that will cause the build and deploy job to trigger again. But this time it's not the main branch that will be deployed, but the branch that we've created. And after we've done that, we will merge that code with the main branch again. And that will again cause the build and deploy job to be triggered, but this time for the main branch. So let's see how this works. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll go back to our main application, main repository. We'll create a new branch called stage and we'll create it from the main branch itself. 
and let's make a few changes to this so i'll click and i'll add a new line of code here so i'll add another html tag again and let's save this particular let's click on commit changes okay so once we've done that we'll create a pull request so i click create a pull request i'll click on new pull request and this time it's going to be from stage to main so once i do that once i create this particular pull request it will build and deploy the stage environment and it will give me a new url for the stage environment itself so let's click on create pull request and let's click on create pull request here build and so this will cause the build and deploy job again to be triggered so let's go to our actions again and you can see that it's creating the stage environment now so let's click on this and let's wait for this build and deploy job to be finished okay so our build and deploy job is done and our stage environment has been created so let's go back to our pull request again and you can see that a url has been triggered here created here so let's click on this so this is the url for the stage environment so let's go back again and this time what we'll do is we'll merge this particular stage environment with our main branch so so now let's click on merge pull request and if i click on confirm merge it will build and deploy the main branch and the second thing it will do is it will also close the current pull request so let's click on confirm merge and let's go to our actions again so here you can so here you can see two jobs got triggered the first job is basically to close the pull request so it will trigger this particular close pull request job and the second workflow will basically just build and deploy the main branch so it's trying to build and deploy the main branch so let's wait for these two jobs to finish so both my workflows have finished running so let's go back to our pull request again and you can see that that particular pull request has been closed and there are no open pull request remaining so let's go back to our code again and let's go to our main branch and if i click on the index.html you'll see the updated index.html here and let's go to our console now let's refresh this and if i open this particular url you can see that the changes are updated here as well so that is it for this particular lecture so in this lecture you've learned the importance of using static web app so your static web app has already a workflow created for you so the ci cd part of your entire application is already ready ready made built for you so you do not need to worry about that so all that you need to build is a new branch and just trigger this particular workflow that is already there for you so that's it for this lecture so if you have any issues with this please do not hesitate to get in touch with me and i'll also send a, I'll, and i'll also share a few links about github workflows so if you have any issues with that you can just refer to those documents so that's it for this lecture i will see you in the next okay in this particular chapter we'll be creating our static web app using the visual studio code so the first thing that you need to do is you need to create a new repository again so all that we need to do is we need to just copy this particular url and this is basically just a template that will create a new repository for you now this particular url i will send in the description below so you can just use this to create your own repository so let's just call this a static web app visual studio and i will create a repository from that particular template so all that it's doing is it's creating a repository and what it does is it creates a source folder and within the source folder is my index.html and it also has a .css a style sheet along with the html so that's all that this has it has nothing more than this particular source directory so now let's go to our visual studio code and you need to add a few extensions so you can go to your extension tab and what you need to do is you need to install the azure static web apps and this has a dependency on azure account and azure resources as well so once you've installed all these three you can go to the azure tab and you can click on the azure web apps and here you can add or create a new static web app so let's create a new one and it will ask you if you have an existing project or if you want to clone from github so let's clone from github from the new repository that we just created so let's click on clone project from github 
and we will choose the latest one that is the static web app visual studio so this was the one which we had created right now and let's select a path for this so let's let's create a new folder for this as well i'll just call this as demo azure and i'll select this location yes i will open this in a new window okay so once i've done this let's click on add again and here it will ask you the name for your static web app so let's call this as static web app visual studio and where do you want this located you want this in central us so let's click on central us and again this is a custom static web app so let's click on custom and this is the important part so here the path of our root directory is source so it's within the source directory that are index.html and css file reside so let's click on the source and let's create our new static web app and you can see that it has created a new static web app and it is currently building and deploying that particular job so let's wait for this to finish so let's go back to a console again and you can see that the static web app visual studio application has been created so let's open this and let's click on this particular url and you can see that our application is up so the index.html page contains this particular line of code so that's it for this lecture in the next lecture we'll be adding a few backends to this particular url so i will see you there Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll add a backend API to our static web app. Now, to do that, you can just click on this particular icon here, create HTTP function. So, we'll create a backend using JavaScript. So, you can just click on JavaScript. And here, you need to give a name for your function. So, let's call this as message. Enter. Okay, so we finally, okay, so let's go back to our code base. And if you go to your code base, you can see that an API folder got added. And within that is basically a function called message. And our code resides within the index.js file. So what we'll do is we will just make some changes to this. So let's remove the unwanted piece and we'll just say, and we'll just return a text. So let's remove this. And we'll just return a text called hello from API. So Okay, so once we've done that, we also need to add some changes to our index.html file. So let's go to our index.html file. And here what I'll do is I will call that particular API that I've just created. So this particular script will call that particular API from the backend. So once this is done, let's... Now apart from this, I will also create a div to display this particular backend. So let's add a div. And within this div, I will just give this particular ID. And it's within this ID that my data will reside. So let's save this. So what will be displayed in this particular ID will be the response of this particular API. And let's look at this particular API and all that this particular API will return is just this particular message saying that hello from API. Okay, so we're done with the code changes. Let's push these changes. So let's, let's save this particular and let's sync it with the main branch. So this action will push and pull commits to and from the origin. I'll click on okay. And let's wait for this process to complete. So once this is pushed to the main branch, so once this is pushed to the main branch, it will again trigger the build and deploy and our changes will be seen automatically. So let's just wait for this to happen. Okay, so our build is finished. So let's open this particular URL now. So if I refresh this particular page, 
you can see that this particular message has been returned from the API. So that's it for this particular lecture. In this particular lecture, you saw how, how you can build backends using Azure functions. So I will see you in the next chapter. So in this particular section, we'll talk about the Azure App Service, which is basically the platform as a service that is provided by Azure. Now, Azure App Service is an HTTP-based service for hosting web applications, REST APIs, and mobile backends. Now, the main reason why you would want to use a tool like Azure App Service is if you want to offload the work of security, load balancing, auto-scaling, and automated management to Microsoft Azure itself. So if you do not want to have the hassle of creating virtual machines, load balancers, and auto-scaling, etc., it's best if you it's best that you create your application in Azure App Service. Now you can also take advantage of its DevOps capabilities, such as having continuous deployment for Azure DevOps, GitHub, and other source and package management tools. And you can also integrate it with custom domains and have SSL certificates for your web-based application. So let's create a first Azure app service. So I'm in my Azure console. So let's create a first app service. So you can search for app service in your search bar. Or you can go to your all services. And under web, you can find your app service. So let's click on this. And let's create a first app service. Let's click on create. And like before, you can create a new resource group or you can put it in an existing one. Let's create a new resource group for this. I'll just call this as app service as well. Click on OK. You need to give a name for your app service. So I'll just call this as OK. So you can either have it as a code or as a doc container. For this particular example, let's just choose code. And you can also select the runtime. So you have the option of .NET, Java, Node, PHP, Python, and Ruby. So for this example, let's choose Node 14. And then here you select your app service plan. So the app service plan is determined based on the location, the cost, the features, and the compute resource that is provided to your app. So let's click on this particular SKU and size, and let's see what the options that we have are. So that is the dev and the test, the production and the isolated environment, and each of them have a separate costing. So for this particular example, let's go for the cheapest one and let's choose the F1, which is basically a free tire. Let's click on deployment again. So do you want to enable or disable continuous? For this example, we'll just choose disable. In our later chapters, we'll see how continuous deployment is done for your app service. Let's go to monitoring. You can either enable or disable application insights. Now let's disable this. Now again, application insights is something that I'll talk about in the upcoming chapters. Then you can just click on next and just click on review and create. And here it will give you all the summary. Now, since we've chosen the free tier, the estimated price is also shown here as free. So let's go down. And here you can see the app service plan. So it's going to be an operating system Linux. The region that we've chosen is central US. And the SKU is free and it's a shared infrastructure. And the memory that we get is 1 GB. So this is basically the app service plan that will be created for you. And let's click on create. OK, so the application is finished. You can go to the resource now. And let's click on this particular URL. So let's wait for this to load. Now, apart from that, if you go back to our main portal, there's, there's also an app service plan that is created. Let's open this. And this gives you all the essential information about this app service plan. So it includes the resource group in which your app service plan is, the location, the which particular tire it is, the operating system, etc. So this is something that will come in handy if you want to get more details about this particular app service. OK, so once your page loads, you will get a screen that looks like this. So basically, till now, what we've done is we've just created an app service. We haven't uploaded our code into it. And that is precisely what we'll be doing in our next chapter. So I will see you in the next chapter. OK, so now that you've created your app service, let's deploy our code on top of this. So to do that, we need to 
log into our Visual Studio Code. And again, we need to install an extension for this. So let's go to the extensions tab. And what we need is the Azure App Service. So I already have my Azure App Service installed. So again, the dependency for this is again the Azure account and the Azure resources. So let's go to our Azure tab now. Okay, so once you've installed your app service extension, the next thing we'll do is we'll create a project. So let's open a new folder. Again, let's go back to our and the first thing that we'll do is we'll do an npm in it to create a project. And let's create an index.js file. So what we'll be creating is just a very basic web server. So let's get the code for our web server. So type node web server. And this is potentially the most common code that you will see for creating a node web server. So I'll just copy this and I'll paste it here. And once I've done this, let's go back to our Azure tab and let's deploy and let's deploy this code to our app service. So I'll click on this. And here it will ask you if you want to create a new web or do you want to use an existing one? So here we can already see the existing web app that we had created in our previous chapter. So this is the VLC app service. It's basically the same app service that we had created. So this app service corresponds to this one, which we see over here. So let's click on this. So we are going to just deploy it to an existing app service and here let's just say yes are you sure you want to deploy to this particular app service yes deploy so it's currently deploying this particular piece of code to this particular app service so let's wait for this process to finish okay so now let's go back to our console so let's refresh this and let's click on this particular URL now. And you can see that our web app is running and it's displaying hello world. So this is the easiest and the quickest way you can install your application in your app service that is using your Visual Studio Code. So the link in description on how to install your Visual Studio Code, I will give in the description below. So you can just have a look at that. So that's it for this chapter. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in this particular section, we'll create an app service using containers and not using code. So let's create our app service. I will put it in my app service resource group. I'll give a name for my app service. And this time, the publisher would be a Docker container and not code. And we'll put it in Linux. So this remains the same. And let's just change this to freeware. So if I click on next, so here it gives me a few options. The first option that it gives me is a quick start and we will proceed with the quick start in this particular chapter. In the upcoming chapters, we'll, I'll explain to you how you can use your Azure Container Registry and your Docker Hub to create container images that can be used in your app service. So for the time being, let's use our Quick start to create a container. And here you have the option of creating an Nginx server. So let's do that. And let's review and create our application. Okay, so we are all done. So we're going to create an Nginx server and it's going to use the app service, free app service plan. So let's click on create and create this particular app service. Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll do two things. The first thing that we'll do is we'll create a container registry. And after that, we'll upload an image into this container registry. So the first thing that we can do is we can open a container registry. So to search for your container registry, you can go to your search bar and you can just type container registry, you'll find it here. Or else you can go to your all services and within your containers, you can find your container registry. So you can just open this. So let's create a container registry. So I can click on this create. So let's put this container registry with an app service. So I'll open this. So here I have to give a name for my registry. So I'll just call this as node app VLC. And it will be in the central US. And, and that's all that I need to do. I'll just click on review and create. 
I click on create. So let's go to our resource. Okay, so now that you've created your container registry, the next thing that we'll do is we'll create a container image. So we'll do this in a local machine itself. So let's open our Visual Studio code. So here I have a Visual Studio code. So I'm going to deploy a node application and I'm going to dockerize it. And the first thing I'll do is I'll run it in my local. And after that, I will deploy the image to our container registry. So let's do that. So I'll open my terminal. Do an NPM in it. And what we'll do is we will deploy the most basic web application in Node. So let's go and check that out. So here is a very basic example on how you can use your Node application and dockerize it. So what we can do is we can just copy this package.json. Of course, this particular URL I will send in the description below. So you don't need to worry about that. So let's go to our package.json and let's copy and the next thing I need to do is I need to create a server.js. And I need to copy my server app piece of code. So this is my server. I'll copy this. And I'll paste it in my server.js. And let's save the package.json as well. And now comes the most important file, and that is the Docker file. So let's copy the Docker file as well. So let's copy this Docker file and I'll explain to you what this particular docker file does as well. So let's copy this. So if you go through this docker file, what it does is it takes in this particular base image, this node base image and within this base image, what it does is it creates a work directory with this particular path and within this work directory, it copies all the package.json into this particular work directory and after that it does an npm install and apart from the package.json it also copies the other application resource so for for our so in our case it's just the server.js file and then it exposes port 8080 and it runs the node server.js so it just runs the application so that's all that this thing does so we'll do one thing we'll just build this particular container image in our local itself and then we will deploy it to our container registry now to build your docker application all that you need to do is you just need to do a docker build and you can also tag your application so let's tag our application so i will just call this as my hello world application and let's dockerize this particular application so let's run this and you have to run this docker build in the same path where your docker file resides so that's one important thing for you to remember so let's run this and this takes a few minutes to execute again okay so finally a docker image has been created and you can see it if you run the docker image ls command so the first thing that we'll do is we'll run this locally now to run this locally you need to run the docker run command and you need to mention the port so here the port 8080 of my local host would be connected to the 8080 of my container image which is basically connected to the application that we are running and we need to give the name of my image id so let's copy this and paste this and let's run this and let's go to our local host and see let's see if this is working so let's do a local host on port 8080 and you can see that it's displaying the hello world so it's connected to my application now okay so now that you've created your docker image the next thing that i need to do is i need to tag this docker image to the container registry now to do that we can just run the docker tag command and we need to tag this particular repository and let's fetch the container registry And the name of this particular repository within this container registry would be also hello world. Okay. 
So here you can see that I've created a new tag. So now the only thing I need to do is I just need to do a Docker push. And just give this particular tag name. Okay, so it says that it's requiring it requires authentication. So let's try to authenticate to our private repository, our container registry. Now to do that, all that you need to do is you go to your access keys here. Enable this. Let's do a clear screen. I want to log into my Docker login. And this is the name of my server. So I'll copy this. I'll paste it. I need to give my username. So this is my username. And this is my password. OK, so now that I have authenticated to that particular server, let's run our previous command again. So I'll do a Docker push. And I'm going to push this particular tag. So let's run this again. And this time you can see that it succeeded. So it's pushing this particular container image to our repository. So let's wait for this to finish. OK, finally, we have pushed our image to our container registry. Now let's go back to our container registry one. So if I go to my overview, if I go to my repositories here now, you can see that a particular repository called Hello World has been created. And let's use this particular repository and let's use this particular tag to create our app service now. So let's go back to our app service again. So we've already created an app service. So let's use this particular app service. So all that we need to do is we need to go to the deployment center. And we need to use container registry here a single container and let's choose the source. The source here would be the Azure container registry. And the registry would be this. The image would be hello world. And the tag would be latest. So, so let's save this particular change. And let's wait for this particular code to be deployed. And after a few minutes, you can see this particular hello world. So currently, my app service is running the Node Express application that I had created locally. So that's it for this chapter. I will see you in the next. OK, so in our previous chapter, we had used the Azure container registry to store our image. In this particular chapter, we'll use the Docker registry to do the same. So I have logged into my hub.docker.com. And let's go to our repository. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll create a repository. So it will be a public repository and it will be called Hello World. Click on Create. OK, so we are done with this. The next thing that we need to do is again, we'll go back to our Visual Studio code. OK, so we'll be using this particular repository to tag a particular image into our GitHub repository. So let's do the docker tag and let's use this repository I'll copy this and the destination would be so let's paste this as well so this will create a tag so let's do a docker image ls again okay so now you can see we've created a tag and this represents the name of the user and this represents the name of the repository. So all that we need to do now is we just need to do a Docker push. And we just need to paste this particular command. 
Okay, so image has been pushed to the repository. Now let's go back and check whether that has actually happened. So let's refresh this particular page. And let's go to tags. And you can see that there is a new tag created here. So let's use this in our app service. So, so let's go back to our app service again. I will. Okay, so now let's create a new app service for this. So I'll click on app service, create app service. I will go to my app service again. So I will just call this as app service. We'll see. And again, it'll be a Docker container within Central US. And let's. on OK. And let's change the size. So this time let's choose a B1. Click on Apply. And let's go to Next. And here what we'll do is we will choose the Docker Hub. And it'll be a public repo. And let's click on Review and Create. Let's click on create. Okay, our deployment is done. So let's go to that resource. Let's open this URL. Okay, so you're finally able to see Hello World. So in this chapter, you were able to create an app service using a public GitHub repository that we created. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had created an index.js and a package.json file and we had manually uploaded this into our app service. Now let's do the same using our GitHub as well. So what I will do is I will create a GitHub repository and I will upload these files. So let's do that. So I will create a repository called app demo. So let's open our GitHub and see if that particular repository has been created. So, okay, you can see that our particular repository has been created. So the next thing that we'll do is we'll go to our app service and we'll go to our deployment center. And we need to log in using our GitHub account now. So select the code source. So what we'll do is we'll select GitHub. And I'm already signed in using my GitHub account. So I just need to choose my organization and the repository that I've created. So the repo is app demo. So this is the repository that I've just created and the master branch. And it will create a workflow configuration. So let's preview this workflow configuration. So whenever a push is made to this master branch, the build and the deploy will happen. So you can just go through this particular workflow. So this gets created in our GitHub account. So let me close this. Let's click on save. So when I save this, a workflow would be created within my repository. So let's click on save. And this will, and let's refresh our GitHub repo. So you can see that our workflow got created. So let's look at our index.js. So it will print a hello world as the output. So let's wait for this deployment to be over. So you can go to your actions and you can see, click on your, and it's throwing a no test. So if you go to your actions, you can see that the build failed. So I just need to remove a few lines from the package.json. So let's go to a package.json and let's remove this particular script for the time being. So let's remove this and let's save it again. And it will automatically trigger the build again. So if I go back to my action again and you can see that our deployment is done. So let's go back to our application again. Let's go to our overview. 
and let's click on this particular and now you can see that this particular hello world is displayed so the next thing that we'll do is we'll make a few changes to our index.js file and let's see if that again triggers the build and deploy workflow so let's go back to our index.js so what i'll do now is i'll click on edit and i'll just add a few more words to this particular line and let's push this to the master branch as well let's click on commit changes and let's go back to our actions again and here you can see that a new workflow run has been triggered so, let, so let us wait for this to complete okay so our workflow is completed so let's go back and check whether it's been updated in the ui and you can see that this particular UI has been updated as well. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now that you've created your application, let's add an authentication layer to this particular application. Now to do that, let's go back to our console. So all that you need to do is you need to go to your authentication here and you need to add an identity provider. So we'll be adding the Azure Active Directory as the identity provider. Now you have the option of adding Google, Facebook, as well as Twitter. Now if now if you have any concerns about how the other identity provider needs to be added, you can always get in touch with me and I will help you out. So for the time being, let's add the Azure AD as the identity provider. So let's click on this. And what we'll do is we'll create a new app in our Azure Active Directory. And it's just going to be for this particular tenant itself. So let's click on add again. And let's wait for this particular process to be over. So this takes a few minutes. So let's wait for this particular process to be over. Okay, so let's try to log in using this particular URL. So I'll use another browser for this. Let's open this. And here you can see that it's been currently redirected to my Azure Active Directory page. So I will just click on accept. And you can see that I get the same message. So let's try to, again, clear the cache and let's try to do this again. So we'll go to my history. Okay. And let's refresh this again. And here again, you get a sign in. So let me sign in once more. So I have a user called Rohit. So I'll just show you my Active Directory once again. So this is my Active Directory. And if I click on users, you can see that I have these three users. So I'm using this particular user to log in. So I'll just, again, open this. I'll copy this particular user. And let's paste this. Click on yes. And you can see that I have successfully logged in. And I get my hello world from GitHub. So this is the same message that I had got in my previous chapter. So that's it for this particular chapter. I hope this was easy for you. So if you're integrating it with Google or Twitter or Facebook, please, if you have any issues, do not hesitate to get in touch with me and I'll try to resolve your issues. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so this is going to be a very simple chapter. So now since we're using a free tire, if you go to your networking section, you have very limited options on what you can do. So all that you can do is you can restrict actions to your inbound traffic. So let's try to do that. So what I'll do is I'll try to restrict this particular IP address from accessing our application. So let's click on access restriction. And let's add a rule. So the rule that I will add is I will deny my particular machine to access this particular URL. So let's get my IP address. So this is currently my IP address. So let me just copy this. And let's add this particular IP address. And here the action that I will perform is I will deny access. And I can just give a name for my settings and I need to give a priority. So the lower the number, the higher the priority. Let's give it a priority of 100 and click on add rule. Okay, so once this rule has been added, let's try to log in to our application again. So let's copy this. And let's try to access our application. And here you'll get a 4043 forbidden. This web app you have attempted to reach has been blocked for your particular access. So 
that's one way in which you can control or restrict access to certain IP addresses. Now, if you go down, you can see that all the other settings are invalidated or they're grayed out. Now, that's because that is because we are currently using the free tier. So in our next chapter or in the next upcoming chapters, we will change our access plan from free to basic. So I will see you in the next chapter. OK, so now let's talk about a very important concept called app service plan. So whenever you created your app service, now underneath this app service, there was a bunch of compute resources that was created for that particular app service to run. Now these compute resources are analogous to a server farm in your conventional web hosting. Now you can have one or more apps that can be configured to run on the same compute resources. So currently what we are using is the free tier. Now the problem with using the free tier app service plan is that not much functionality is available within that. So why do you create your app service? If you go to your app service plan, you can see and you can change the size of your app service plan. So currently what I have is the free tier. Now, unfortunately, you can only have one free tier in your account or in your subscription. So let's click on apply and let's create this free tier service app once more. Let's click on create. OK, so now that you've created your app service, now you can see that this particular app service is connected to the app service plan, which is basically a free tier. Now, unfortunately, if you're using a free tier, most of the functionalities that you would need are not available to you. Now, apart from the most obvious one of having very limited computing power, now there are certain other function functionalities as well that are not available to you. So for example, if you want to connect to your virtual network or if you want to have access to your private endpoints, it's not available if you're using your free tier. Now, similarly, the other issue involves that you can't scale out. So you can have only one instance. So if you want to scale out, you have to use either your standard or basic plan. So in our next chapter, we'll discuss on how we can change our app service plan from free tier to either a standard or a basic service plan. So I'll see you in the next chapter. OK, in this particular chapter, we'll see how we can change the app service plan for your app service. Now, to do that, you can go to your change app service plan here. And what we'll do is we'll update the pricing tier. So currently we're using the free version. So what we'll use is we'll go to the production tab here. And let's click on set additional options. And we'll choose the standard pricing tier. And I'll click on apply and I'll click on OK. And now again, if you go back to our app service, you can see that it's currently using the S1 standard. So let's click on this app service plan once more. And you can see that the service plan has been changed to S1 standard. So that's it for this particular lecture. So now in this particular chapter, you learned how we can change your tire in your app service plan. So I will see you in the next chapter. OK, so now that we've changed the standard tire from free tire, we can now set up our custom domain. Now to do that, you can click on your custom domains here. And you can click on add custom domain. So here you need to verify your custom domain. So I have a custom domain. Let's click on validate. So here what I need to do is I need to set the A record as well as my verification ID. So to do that, I need to log into my DNS account for my particular domain. So let's do that. So I have connected my A record to this particular IP address as mentioned here. And I've also set the TXT record. So this is the TXT record that I have set. So all that I need to do now is, and once the validation is done, all that I need to do is I just need to click on add custom domain. And let's refresh this particular page. So currently, I do not have any SSL for my particular custom domain, though you can add it using this particular add binding. So that's something we'll do later. So let's, for the time being, let's just check this particular domain and let's see whether it redirects us to this particular application. So I paste it. You can see that I get this particular response. So I have basically connected my application to this particular custom domain. So that's it for this lecture. Now, if you have any issues with this, in touch with me. So I'll see you in the next chapter. OK, in this particular chapter, we'll talk about a common scenario that you'll encounter. So we have an app service. And this particular app service is trying to connect to an application within our VNet. 
Now, this application could be anything from a database to a cache, or it could be even a private application within a virtual network. And we need to connect using just the private IP. So this particular application is not available on the internet. So it has to be connected internally using your Azure network. So let's see how we can create an architecture like this. So to do this, we need to, okay, so first thing to note is that your service plan should be the standard of production. So it cannot be free or basic and it doesn't work in those ties. So the next thing that we'll do is we will create a virtual machine and that virtual machine will have a endpoint and we will connect to that particular endpoint. So let's, so I already have created a virtual machine. So this is my virtual machine and let's try to log into this virtual machine. So I'll be using the public IP to log into this machine. So I'll be using putty to log into the machine. So I have created a small application. So let me just show you that application. So this is a very basic application that I've created and all that it does is it just returns a foobar as a JSON when I click on this particular URL. So it's a very basic application and it does nothing special. So this is an express application. So this particular code I will paste in the description below. So if you want to have a look at it, you can just copy this as well. So like I said previously, it just returns a foobar. So let's run this particular application. So it's currently running the application. So let's try to log into this particular application. So all that I'll do is I'll just copy this URL. And I need to use port 8080. So I've also opened port 8080 so that I'm able to read this. So this just returns a foobar. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to access this particular application using the private IP. So currently this is a public IP. So I'll be removing access to the public IP and I would just want my private app IP to access this particular application. So the private IP of this particular application is, let's go back to our virtual machine again. And if you go down the networking section, you can see that this is a private IP. And one more thing to remember is that if you open this networking tab, you can see that I have opened port 8080. So that's the reason why I was able to access that using port 8080. Okay, so we have a virtual machine ready and we have a private IP through which we can access that particular application. The next thing that we need to do is we need to modify our app service so that but that particular app service is able to read from this particular virtual machine. So let's go back to our virtual machine app service again. And let's, so currently I'm using my GitHub repo and a repo called app demo to publish my application. So let's go to the master branch and let's open a piece of code. So again, this just has an index.js and all that this application does again is it just tries to access this particular URL using the private IP address. So this is a private IP address and again, it's port 8080. And using this particular IP address, that is a private IP address, I will just return a response back to the user and this user can get that information. Now, one more thing to note is that it, it uses the Axios framework to call the API. And of course, you can use any other framework as well. And it also uses the Express frameworks. So I've used two extra frameworks. One is the Express and the other is the Axios framework. So it's a very basic application. So let's deploy this application. So again, all that I need to do is I just need to commit changes and it will auto deploy to the app service. Let's click on commit changes. Okay, so once you've done that, now we need to do, do the most important thing that is connect our app service to our VNet. Now to do that, all that you need to do is you need to again, go to your networking section. And under the outbound traffic, you need to switch on VNet integration. So let's click on this. Let's click on add VNet. Now we've already created a virtual network and, and it's within this particular virtual network that my VM resides. Now, one thing to note is that your virtual network and your app service should reside within the same region. So my VNet is within central US and so is my app service. So that's one important thing that you should remember. So let's open this. And we need to create a new subnet for our app service. So let's click on create a new sub subnet. I'll just call this as app service subnet. Okay, so this is my VNet block. So let's create another subnet. Let's make this as 10, 0, 3, 0, slash 24. 
and let's click on OK. And it's configuring my vignette integration. So let's wait for this to finish. Okay, so right now our app service is connected to our particular VNet which contains the virtual machine. So yeah, I think we are all set. So all that we need to do is we just need to access our application. So let's go to overview again. And let's try to connect to our URL. So you can see this particular output. So I was successfully able to connect to my virtual machine using the private IP address. Once again, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any issues with the code. Now the GitHub link to the code, I will send in the description below. So you can always check that out. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, in this particular section, we'll talk about how we can create a stage environment for our app service. So to do that, let's check our URL first. So I have created a URL and this URL displays version 1.0 and the environment that I have is production. And this particular environment I have configured in this particular configuration here. So if you can check this particular environment, this particular environment has a value of production. So now let's create a staging environment. Now to do that, you can go to your deployment slots, which is under deployment. So you can click on this. And the first thing that we'll do is we'll create a new slot. So to do that, you can click on add slot. And here, let's give a name for our slot. So let's call this as staging. And I will make this a clone of our current production service. So let's clone this current service and let's click on add. So what this does is it creates a separate environment altogether and this particular environment has its own URL. So let's wait for this particular environment to be created. So as you can see that we have created an, another slot and this particular slot is our staging environment. So let's open this particular staging environment. So now this particular staging environment has its own deployment and setting and configuration. So it's a completely separate environment altogether. So let's try to open the URL for our staging environment. So as you can see that this particular URL is suffixed with staging here. So let's open this. So currently this particular environment is not pointing to any code. So the first thing that we'll do is we will make a staging branch in our GitHub and we will point that particular branch to this environment. So let's do that. So currently I'm in the repository that's pointing to my production slot. So if I go to my index.js, you can see that it says it's version 1.0 and the environment is just the environment that we set in our configuration. So let's create a branch out of this. So let's call this as the stage branch and let's create it from the master branch. And this particular stage branch will currently be the latest version. So I'll just make this as 2.0, I'll just edit this. So this is currently the latest code that we have. So this is something that we will commit and let's commit the change here. Okay, so now that we've created a staging branch, the next thing that we'll do is we'll go to our staging slot in our app service and let's click on deployment center. So here we have to connect our GitHub stage branch to this particular deployment center. So let's click on GitHub and let's select the organization. So this everything remains the same. And it's again the app demo branch, uh, the app demo repository. And the branch that we will select would be the stage branch. And we'll add a workflow to this as well. And let's click on preview file. So it'll run this particular job when an update happens to the stage branch. So let's, so this is all straightforward. This is the same that you saw previously while we were configuring the production branch as well. So let's click on save. And let's wait for this process to complete and let's wait for our stage environment to be up. So again, let's go back to our actions here. And you can see that our workflow is running. Okay, so our workflow has finished running. The first thing that I'll go is I'll go to my configuration for my staging environment and I will change the environment value from production to staging. And I'll click on OK. So the next thing I will do is I'll try to access this URL. So let's click on save here, continue. Click on overview.
I'll click on this URL. And this is the output that I get. So currently my staging has my latest version 2.0 and the environment is staging. So some of the important features of using the slot is that the first thing you can do is you can always validate your code before you move it to production. So you can check all the functionalities of your version 2.0 before moving it to production. Okay, so once I've done that, once I've seen all my functionalities, let's move our staging code to production. Now to do that, all that you need to do is you need to go to your deployment slots again and you need to swap your production with staging. So let's click on swap here. And let's click on swap here. Okay, so my swap is over. So let's close this and let's go back to our production app service slot. So currently I'm in my production app service slot and let's try to go to our overview. And let's click on this main URL of ours. So this is our main production URL. So if I open this, so my staging environment code has moved to my production now. Now let's check what has happened to our staging environment. So if I go back to my deployment slots again, and if I open my staging environment, now this staging environment will be pointing to my version 1.0. That is the previous version which was there in production. So let's open this particular staging environment URL. So if I open this again, so you can see that this currently contains version 1.0 and the environment is again staging. So now let's assume that something went wrong with our production and you want to revert back all the changes that you have that you previously had. That is you want the staging version 1.0 to be back again to your production environment. Now to do that is quite easy. So all that you need to do is you need to again swap the change. So let's go back to our deployment slots again. And now let's do a swap again. So Let's click on swap. Okay, so the swap is finished again. So let's close our application. Now let's go back to our production environment again. So I'm in my production environment and let's click on overview. So let's see what happens if I click on this production URL again. So it should point back to our version 1.0 again. So let's run this again. And you can see that it's again pointing to our version 1.0 and our staging should point to version 2.0. So if I go to my deployment slots again, and if I open my staging environment, and if I open this URL, it should point, into, it should point to 2.0. So this is a very quick and easy way to swap your changes if in case there was some issue with your production after deployment so you can always revert it back with just one click of a button so that's it for this lecture i hope this was useful for you i will see you in the next chapter so in this particular chapter we'll talk about matrix that are available in your app service so you can go to your monitoring and underneath you'll find your matrix so you can just open this and here you will get a screen that looks like this so here you can get all information about the matrix that are available so for example if you want to know how many Request was sent with a HTTP 200 response. So you can just open this and here you'll get the appropriate information. So for this particular time span, there was 79 requests sent. Now, for example, if you also want to know things like how many total requests were sent, so you can get that information from here as well. And you can also have it as one of these. So for example, if you want to see it as a bar chart, you can just click on this. Or if you want to see it as a grid you can just click on this so it will just show you the grid without any visual information also another important factor is you can also define at what particular time interval you want so for example i can just choose it for my last one hour so if i click on this and i click on apply you can see the value changes so this is specific just for the previous one hour so these matrix are useful especially if you want to create alerts and that's precisely what we'll be doing in the next chapter so i'll see you in the next chapter where we'll create alerts using these matrix so I'll see you there. Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll talk about creating alerts using matrix. So let's click on alerts. And the first thing I need to do is I need to click on new alert rule. And here, the first thing I need to do is I need to add a condition which will trigger my alert. So you can click on add condition here. And here you can choose all the matrix that you saw previously in, in the previous chapter. So what we'll use is the HTTP 200. 
and the condition that we will use is basically greater than total so let's put this value as 10 so this can be any random arbitrary value so what this particular condition st states is that whenever the total 200 request is greater than 10 for a aggregated period of the five minutes then this particular trigger will be activated so let's click on done okay so once that is done you can also add an action group so let's click on add action group so here you can create a new action group and you can connect it to an email id to which you want this particular alert to be sent so let's click on create action group i'll call this as my admin action click on review and create uh, before that let's click on notification so here i will connect it to an email sms or push so let's give a name for this and i will connect it to an email id so this particular email id will receive an alert whenever this alert is triggered so let's click on review and create let's click on create and finally you just need to give a name for your rule so i'll just call this as my admin rule and let's create this alert And after you've created your alert, all that you need to do is you need to go to your app service, you need to go to your main URL and trigger this particular URL 10 times. So let's do that. Okay, so I've triggered this 10 times. So now all that we need to do is we need to go to our alerts again. And here you can see that this particular trigger has been activated. So let's click on this and you can get all necessary information. Now, apart from this, let's go and check if our email ID has also received this particular alert. So now let's go and look at our email ID. So if you open your email ID, you will receive a message that looks something like this. So this was sent by Azure itself to tell you that this particular alert that we had previously created has been triggered. So that's it for this lecture. I hope this was useful. I'll see you in the next lecture.